conditions. We connect thousands of kids and adults to our local public lands each year through outdoor education events. We do rafting trips and field trips out on the land. Um, we plan and coordinate stewardship projects. So those involve restoration projects as well as trash cleanups. And then we also have community events for folks to enjoy. Um, so those include hikes out on our public lands or webinars such as this. So our webinars um, just have the goal to teach you something new about the public lands that we're so lucky to have in our backyard. You know, I'm sure most of you have hiked around in them and know a decent amount of information on them, but there's so much um, more still to learn. So that's why we invite these expert guests to join us and teach us something new. So tonight we are here with Thomas Fresquist. He is a fish biologist with the Bureau of Land Management. Um, and he will be talking to us about the native and non-native fish in our local rivers and some recent work he's been doing in the national conservation areas. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Tom. Um, we will be saving about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of this webinar for questions. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to put them in the questions and answers box um, at the bottom of your screen, or you can type them into our chat box at any time. Once again, we'll be saving those for the end of the webinar. So with that, Tom, I'll let you go ahead and get started. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. Yeah. So again, my name's Tom Fresquis. Uh, I'm a BLM fish biologist for the Northwest portion of Colorado. Um, I'll be sharing you with you this evening some information on some of the really cool uh, fish species that use the Dominguez Escalani NCA and the McGinnis Canyon NCA. Uh, these units are managed by the Bureau of Land Management out of the Grand Junction Field Office. Uh, and as Sarah had mentioned, uh, the BLM does enjoy a great cooperative relationship with the Colorado Canyons Association on the management of these two unique landscapes. So, uh, I'm excited to kind of share with you guys some cool information on some of the aquatic species and habitats. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my, uh, my co-authors on this talk. Uh, my counterpart for the southwest part of Colorado is Rush Chapuntich. Uh, he does cover the, uh, uh, the, that portion of the Dominguez Escalani NCA that's in the, the Montrose uh, Uncompagri field office. Uh, and then Jen Logan, who's uh, the aquatic native species biologist for Colorado Parks and Wildlife for Northwest Colorado. Uh, I work extensively with Jen Logan on uh, native fish management, uh, and she was a big help on this talk. So um, specifically what I'll be sharing with you this evening is an overview of the aquatic habitats found within the Dominguez Escalani and the McGinnis Canyon NCAs. Um, some of the fish species and amphibian species of interest in each of the conservation areas. Um, some of the sampling and monitoring techniques that are used to, uh, to monitor our populations. Um, some of the monitoring and research, as well as a project that we have ongoing in the NCAs. Uh, and then some discussion about habitat connectivity uh, for these fish species. Uh, and then I'll wrap things up with some of the future work that we're planning to do on aquatic species and then try to answer any questions you all might have. So. Uh, and thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it. Hopefully this will be informative and hopefully a little bit interesting for you. So I will begin with uh, the Dominguez Escalani NCA. Here's a map of the NCA kind of bounded in green. Uh, kind of shows the primary aquatic habitats. The, the Gunnison River um, kind of flows uh, along that boundary to the northeast through the NCA. And then some of the larger tributaries kind of moving from the southeast to the northwest is Cottonwood Creek. And then Little Dominguez Creek and its primary tributary, which is Rose Creek. Uh, then we also have, oh, I'm sorry, I passed up Escalante Creek and the North Fork of Escalante Creek, sorry about that. Then we have, yeah, Little Dominguez Creek, Rose Creek, Big Dominguez Creek, and then on the northwestern boundary is East Creek, which kind of bounds uh, the NCA along Highway 141 there in Unaweep Canyon. Uh, so I'll be sharing a little bit of information on these habitats here. Uh, the Gunnison River, of course, is the largest aquatic system within the Dominguez Escalani NCA. Um, it's home to many aquatic species of fish and amphibians, including both native and non-native species. Uh, Escalani Creek uh, begins as a cold water fishery 
comprised primarily of rainbow trout on the, in the headwaters on US Forest Service and BLM managed lands. And then it transitions into a warm water native fishery in the lower portions. Uh, it does contain both native and non-native aquatic species uh, and is a tributary to the Gunnison River. The North Fork of Escalante Creek is tributary to Escalante Creek. Uh, this is comprised of a cold water fishery. Uh, it contains native Colorado River cutthroat trout. And I'll talk a bit more about a project that we were doing on my counterpart did on this stream uh, just a bit later here. Uh, this is a photo of Little Dominguez Creek. Uh, this is a, the higher elevation portion of Little Dominguez Creek within the NCA. Uh, in this portion of the stream is, is a cold water fishery comprised of rainbow trout. This stream does transition into a lower elevation stream with native fish, primarily speckled dace, prior to joining Big Dominguez Creek. And then this is Rose Creek. This is a primary tributary to Little Dominguez Creek. Again, this is near the headwaters, uh, so it's a cold water trout fishery that contains rainbow trout. Kind of a, a pretty little stream up there. Uh, this is Big Dominguez Creek, the upper portions. Uh, this portion of, of the stream within the NCA does contain a cold water rainbow trout fishery. Uh, this stream also transitions downstream to a warm water fishery in the lower elevations. Here's a picture of Dominguez Creek on the lower end. It's kind of cool how it goes through this neat geologic outcrop and it forms these big, large um, pothole pools uh, prior to entering the Gunnison River. Uh, here's a photo of Cottonwood Creek. This is kind of a unique system within Dominguez Escalani NCA. This creek can flow really big in the spring, but then goes dry most of the summer through winter. Um, it's a tributary to Rubidoux Creek that then enters the Gunnison River. And I'll talk a little bit more about this stream later uh, as well. And then finally, East Creek. Again, this is on that uh, northeastern border of the NCA along uh, Unweep Canyon. Uh, this creek is similar to Cottonwood Creek in that it can flow really big in the spring during spring snowmelt, but then goes intermittent to mostly dry uh, uh, most summers. Uh, so it's kind of neat that we're documenting some fish use uh, during seasonal times. And I'll talk about this one a bit more later too. So now moving on to some of the habitats of uh, the McGinnis Canyon NCA. Uh, here's a map showing the boundary. Uh, primary aquatic habitats in this, this unit are of course the Colorado River. Most of you are probably familiar with the Colorado River. And of course that, that section um, from, from Loma down to uh, the Black Rocks area near the Colorado-Utah border. Uh, other tributaries of interest for aquatic species in this NCA include Salt Creek that comes in from the north, uh, Mee Canyon, and Knowles Canyon that are both tributaries that come in from the south. So the Colorado River, here's a couple of landscape level photos of the Colorado River within the NCA. That lower picture is kind of a neat one. It shows that, that Black Rocks area kind of cool that that rock outcrop of that, you know, 1.3 million year old rock that kind of shows itself there in the Colorado River in that section, kind of creates for some unique habitat and some really cool visual scenery down there. Uh, the Colorado River, again, is home to numerous native and non-native aquatic species of fish and amphibians. Uh, this is a photo of Salt Creek. Again, this is that tributary that comes in from the north right around the Mac area. Um, it's a tributary directly to the Colorado River, and this, this stream is used by many native fish species. And I'll talk quite a bit about some of the work that we're doing cooperatively with Colorado Parks and Wildlife in this system in just a little bit. This is a cool photo of Mee Canyon. Uh, this is a small desert stream that comes in from the south, again, tributary directly to the Colorado River. Uh, this stream is home to some native amphibians and as yet to be determined fish species. Uh, we had some folks doing some uh, amphibian survey work in 2019 and they noted some fish. So we're excited to get back into Mee Canyon and collect some of those fish species and identify what, what fish are in there. This is kind of a good picture of the, the Mee Canyon alcove and it's, it's well worth the hike if you can hike up to this. Uh, this is a photo of Knowles Canyon, another desert stream that comes in from the south, directly tributary to the Colorado River. This one is, is also home to some native amphibians 
and as yet to be determined fish species. Again, there was fish noted during some amphibian survey work in 2019. So we're gonna get back in there and, and try to figure out what fish species are using this small tributary. Uh, so next I'll talk about uh, the, some of the fish species and amphib amphibian species of interest within the NCAs. Uh, we'll start with the four endangered fish species that use these NCAs. Uh, the first being the Colorado pike minnow. Uh, the Colorado pike minnow is a federally endangered species under the Endangered Species Act. It is found within the Colorado River, within the McGinnis Canyon NCA, and the Gunnison River within the Dominguez Escalante NCA. Uh, it also is being uh, shown to use some, some of the smaller tributaries on occasion, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, this is a top predator species. But what's kind of cool is that it's the largest member of the minnow family. So it's, it's the Colorado pike minnow. So it's a, it's a minnow, but it's the largest representative of the minnow family. Historically, this species got up to six feet in length in the Colorado River Basin and fish weighed up to 80 pounds, uh, which is really cool. Just, just a big, big, large predator fish. Um, currently, they don't see fish Biologists who are out sampling, we generally don't see fish beyond about three feet in length and up to about 20 to 25 pounds. Uh, this species was historically abundant in the Colorado River Basin, and these fish were, fought, were sought after as food fish uh, and were often referred to as the white salmon by early settlers. Um, folks sometimes think they catch these, and it's possible that anglers on occasion will catch this species, but it's more likely that they're actually catching catching smaller round-tailed chub, uh, another species that I'll talk about in just a little bit, that kind of looks similar to pike minnow at smaller sizes, but it's probably more likely they're catching round-tailed chub than the, than the endangered pike minnow. Um, this species has been primarily impacted by habitat alterations, including dams, diversions, uh, reduced river flows, loss of floodplain connectivity, invasive riparian species, and of course, the introduction of non-native and competitive fish species. Uh, this species is a really long-lived fish. It lives over 30 years, uh, which is kind of cool. A lot of our native fish, will, that'll be a consistent message is a lot of these fish are, are really long-lived species. Uh, and the Colorado pike minnow is, is, is well known for its long distance migrations. And of course, it's big, beautiful lips. And I'll talk about some of the long distance migration stuff in just a little bit. Uh, so the, one of my favorite sucker species is the razorback sucker. Again, federally listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. You can note that kind of large bony like keel on the back of its back. Uh, that's what of course gives it its name, the razorback. Um, this species is also found in the Colorado River and Gunnison River within the two NCAs, uh, as, as well as some of the smaller tributaries on occasion. Uh, this species is also impacted similarly to the pike minnow by habitat alteration and non-native competitive fish species. Uh, this species is the longest lived fish within the NCAs. Uh, fish can live up to 50 years. It's just really cool. This is one of the oldest living fish in the Colorado River Basin. Uh, individuals have been found to live up to 50 years old, so pretty cool. Uh, and again, this is another long distance migrator. Uh, next up, the third of the four endangered fish species is the bony tail. Uh, this species is also listed as federally endangered. It occurs in both the Colorado River and Gunnison Rivers within the NCAs as well as select tributaries. Uh, it is the rarest of the four endangered fish. Um, wild populations were essentially extinct before uh, a few wild fish were brought into captivity in the late 1970s and early 1980s from some fish that were found in Lake Mojave, Arizona. Um, so fish now are, are, are primarily collected that were stocked of, of hatchery origin. Uh, stocking has been used to obviously try to increase numbers within their historic range in the Colorado River Basin. Uh, this species is known for its uh, pencil thin tail, hence its name, the bony tail, and its elegant swimming ability. Uh, threats to this species, again, pretty common theme, uh, habitat alteration and non-native competitive species. And again, another long lived species, uh, bony tails can live up to 30 years or so. Uh, the last of the four endangered fish species using the NCA is the humpback chub. 
This species is only found in the Black Rocks area of the Colorado River in the McGinnis Canyon NCA, where it prefers turbulent deep water canyon reaches and whitewater habitats. Uh, again, note that large kind of hump pronounced right behind its head that gives it its name, the humpback chub. Uh, there's relatively few wild populations left in the Colorado River Basin, but the few that exist are relatively stable. Uh, there's the one at Black Rocks, and then the next closest one to us is the one down uh, at Westwater Canyon in Utah. And again, threats are the same, habitat alteration, as well as non-native fish introductions. Again, another long-lived species, 30 plus years or so. Uh, and this species is known for its exceptional whitewater skills. Uh, so the round-tailed chub is the first of a group of three native fish species that we collectively call the three species. Uh, they all use similar type habitats and are all in decline range-wide. Uh, because they're all in decline range-wide and they use similar habitats, a conservation plan was written and signed by numerous state and federal agency partners across this, these three species ranges uh, to work to try to bolster populations, protect habitats, and try to preclude the need to list these fish under the Endangered Species Act. So, so these fish don't have any federal protection per se, you know, with regard to Endangered Species Act protection, and we're hoping to keep it that way. We don't want any of these species to have to become listed. So uh, there's a big group of several states and partners trying to do good things to, to preclude the need to list these species. Uh, so the round-tailed chub is um, native to the Colorado River. It's found within the NCAs in the Colorado River and Gunnison Rivers. Uh, and it also uses um, select tributaries. It prefers a deeper pool habitat with some structure. Um, it's a relatively long-lived species, 10 years. And again, threats are similar to the endangered fish species, habitat alteration and non-native competitive species. Um, What's kind of cool is, is the coloration that they get. You can see that top photo is kind of a, a round-tailed chub outside of the spawning season. But in the spring, during that lower photo, you can see that they really get a beautiful coloration on them. They get that really bright orange on their belly, fins, and even on their face kind of. It's re really cool when they transition into their spring, spring spawning colors. Uh, another kind of neat thing about round-tailed chub is that they're, they're also predatory. They, they do feed similar to trout. They'll eat insects and small fish, um, but they don't have teeth, which is kind of interesting. Um, at smaller sizes, again, this is that species that are often misidentified as Colorado pike minnow by anglers who think they've caught a pike minnow when they've probably most likely caught this species. So, uh, The second of the three species is the the flannel mouth sucker. This is probably my favorite fish species for sure. I, I really like flannel mouth suckers. They're just cool looking. Um, these again are native to the Colorado River Basin. Um, and these are also in decline range wide, similar to the round tail chub. Uh, again, these get really beautiful coloration during the spring spawning time. They get a really golden orange belly uh, with a dark olive green top on their back. Um, really cool looking fish. Uh, and, and they grow big. These, these fish as well get up to two and a half feet in length. And these fish also live up to 30 plus years. Uh, you can kind of see on that upper photo that their, their mouth, uh, kind of that fleshy lips that gives them their name, the flannel mouth. Uh, they use these as sort of a broom to collect algae and bugs from the river uh, and rocks, from the river rocks rather, uh, for food. So uh, just, just kind of a neat biology on how they feed and stuff. Um, these, fish, these fish utilize both the larger Colorado and Gunnison rivers within the NCAs, but they also use smaller tributaries within the NCAs during the spring to spawn. The third of the three species fish is the bluehead sucker. Again, another native to the Colorado River Basin, another long-lived species, 20 plus years these fish can live. Again, found in both the Colorado and Gunnison rivers, as well as some of the smaller tributaries. This species can actually complete its life cycle in smaller tributaries. So this species can actually live in small streams year round. It, it doesn't just use some of the smaller tributaries uh, on a seasonal basis. It can actually live there year round in some cases. Uh, the blue head is known for its beautiful blue head as that lower picture shows kind of a good, good depiction of a, of a blue head with a really pronounced blue head. Um, on the le upper left photo, you can see the, the mouth parts uh, the cartilaginous scraper, you can kind of see that, that, that 
scraping plate there, that, that's used to scrape the rocks and, and collect algae and bugs. Um, their mouth is also used to, to, to uh, kind of suction to the rocks. They can actually kind of use their mouth to help them stay in place during turbulent flows that are often seen in some of these larger river systems. So not only are they functional for feeding, but they use them to kind of keep themselves in place in the river. And again, note that you know, brilliant coloration in the upper right photo, that, that fish with that really bright red lateral line along the side. Uh, just really pretty fish in the spring when they get all colored up for spawning. Uh, so for the trout lovers out there, we do have native Colorado River cutthroat trout. This species is found only currently in the North Fork of Escalante Creek. Uh, this, this species was likely the native trout species in the cold water portions of the of the NCA, uh, including Escalante Creek, Big Dominguez Creek, Little Dominguez Creek, and Rose Creek within Dominguez Escalante. Um, we do now have non-native rainbow trout in a lot of those systems in the headwaters. But the North Fork has uh, native cutthroat trout. Uh, this is a small stream dweller and requires clear, cold, well oxygenated water with very limited sediment. Uh, threats to this species include competition with non-native trout species such as brown trout, rainbow trout, brook trout, uh, and of course, rainbow trout being in the same genus uh, can readily hybridize with this species. So um, rainbow trout are doubly bad. They can outcompete them for food and habitat, but they can also hybridize with them. Uh, other threats to cutthroat trout include a warming climate uh, and of course, habitat alteration. Uh, another one of my favorite fish, I guess a lot of these are my favorites. They're just, they're just cool. This is uh, the mottled sculpin, uh, kind of a small, four or five inch fish uh, inhabits some of the cold to cool to cold water portions of tributaries within the NCA and the Gunnison and Colorado rivers. Uh, this species has no current special status, um, but it has some cool, cool characteristics. It has really large pectoral fins that kind of help keep it on the bottom of the river. And they use their fins to kind of agitate the stream bottom and cover up with sands to kind of blend in with the substrate and hide from predators. Uh, this species is a good indicator of, of good water quality, uh, more specifically a lack of fine sediments as it, it needs those interstitial spaces between the larger rocks where it lives. So when you have too much sediment, of course, that fills in those spaces between the rocks and, the, and this fish doesn't do well with that. So uh, just, just a cool looking little native fish. Uh, and then last but not least of the native fishes of interest in the NCAs is the speckled dace. Uh, this species has no special status. It's fairly common actually in western Colorado. Uh, it's a small minnow uh, found in many of the streams and in, in, in the larger systems, Colorado and Gunnison within the NCA. Uh, th this one puts on the bright orange lipstick we say in the, in the spring um, during spawning and, and also its fins get really bright orange. Uh, it gets really nice coloration. Uh, populations of this species appear pretty stable. We're not too concerned with it. It's, it's pretty common. But again, another nice native species. So switching gear to some of the native amphibian species within the NCAs, this is the northern leopard frog. Uh, this species is found within the Colorado and Gunnison rivers in the NCAs, but also uses smaller tributaries, small ponds, springs, seeps, and wetland type habitats. Uh, it is a BLM sensitive species. Uh, it's kind of on the fringe of their range and of course, amphibians worldwide aren't doing very well. So this is a species of interest to BLM. Uh, this species is known for its leopard print spots. Uh, this, this photo I thought was a really good one that kind of articulates that. Obviously it's the leopard frog. So kind of a cool, cool spotting pattern. Uh, primary threats to leopard frogs include non-native bullfrogs and chytrid fungus. Uh, chytrid fungus is a common disease of amphibians worldwide um, that's impacting amphibians. So. Uh, this is the red spotted toad. This one's found in the small desert streams within the NCAs, as well as ponds, wetland areas, and seeps and springs. Uh, this species has no, oh, sorry about that. This species has no special status um, like currently, um, but it's just kind of a neat little native toad. It's, it's obviously known for its you know, red spotting pattern. Um, and again, threats are similar to, to leopard frogs, non-native bullfrogs, and then chytrid fungus. Uh, this is the woodhouse toad, another native. Uh, it's pretty common 
uh, again, utilizes the larger river systems and smaller tributaries, as well as ponds, springs, and wetlands within the NCAs. No special status. This, this one's pretty common in the Grand Junction area. Um, you may have seen these in your yard. These, these are pretty common. Um, but again, threats include bullfrogs and, and the chytrid fungus. Uh, the canyon tree frog. This is found in some of the desert streams within the NCAs. Uh, has no special status. Uh, but it's just kind of a neat native amphibian. It has bright yellow orange coloration on the inside of its legs. So it's not, not as exciting to look at from the top, but when you can actually get close to one of these and look at the underside, it's kind of a neat looking frog. It's got some really brilliant colors. Uh, again, same threats, bullfrogs and, and, and disease vectors. Uh, so now a couple of the, the desirable non-native sport fish that occur within the NCA. So cutthroat trout are a desirable sport fish as well, but these are, these are a couple of non-native, but desirable sport fish that are found within the NCAs. Rainbow trout are not native to Colorado. They're actually native to the west coast of the U.S. But as you probably know, rainbow trout are extensively stocked across the U.S. or as a desired sport fish. Um, rainbow trout inhabit the headwaters, like I'd mentioned, of Dominguez Creek. Uh, Big Dominguez Creek, Little Dominguez Creek, Rose Creek, and portions of uh, Upper Escalante Creek within the NCA. Uh, and a few are collected some, sometimes during sampling of the Gunnison River as well. Uh, brown trout are a little less common. There's a, a small number of brown trout that also inhabit the Gunnison River within the Dominguez Escalante NCA. And we have found this species in East Creek uh, within the Gun uh, Dominguez Escalante NCA. Uh, they're, they're probably washing in from a tributary to East Creek uh, seasonally. And brown trout are actually native to Europe. And again, they were, were introduced into the US as a desired sport fish. Uh, so next we'll talk a little bit about some of the more undesirable non-native species that are found within the NCAs. Uh, so we have a couple of, of sucker species, uh, the, the long nose sucker and white sucker. These are neither of which are native to Western Colorado or the Colorado River Basin, but uh, are well established in many portions of Western Colorado. Uh, these sucker species um, utilize both the Colorado River and Gunnison Rivers within the NCAs. And white suckers actually are pretty common in some of the tributary streams as well. They'll, they'll readily utilize smaller tributaries. Uh, the concern with these two sucker species is that they can they can mate and hybridize with the native suckers. They're all in the same genus, so and they're all spring spawning species. So where they coexist, there's there's high likelihood that they can interbreed with the native suckers, which re reduces their genetic purity. Um, they can also compete with native fish species for food and habitat. Uh, there's a group of predatory fish species of concern. Uh, those include bass, uh, both smallmouth and largemouth bass, northern pike, channel catfish, and walleye, among others. Um, these species are found within the Colorado and Gunnison rivers, uh, generally in pretty, pretty small numbers. Um, biologists are actively trying to keep numbers of these species down um, very low if, if, you know, trying to actually remove these to the extent we can. Um, because again, they're, they're predatory and they eat other fish and they're particularly hard on the native fish species that didn't evolve with them. Uh, they, can, they also compete for food and habitat resources with native fish species. Um, so again, Parks and Wildlife, US Fish and Wildlife Service and other partners have ongoing efforts to try to reduce density, densities of these species within the Colorado and Gunnison rivers. Uh, again, they're desired in some areas as sport fish, but they're just not desired where we're trying to prioritize management of our native fish species. Uh, and then the non-native American bullfrog. Um, again, this is the primary, one of the primary threats to the native amphibians. It's a pretty voracious predator, uh, non-native predator that will prey on native amphibians and dis displace them from occupied habitats. Uh, and they will also readily eat young native fish. They, they, they actually eat fish, they eat, they eat a lot of stuff. <laughs> it's pretty crazy what, what bullfrogs will eat. So. Uh, uh, again, this species is found in both NCAs along the Gunnison and Colorado rivers, as well as some of the tributaries, and, and populations appear to potentially be expanding. Uh, we, we did partner in 2019 with uh, Colorado Mesa University, uh, 
the U.S. Geological Survey, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, uh, on some, some tributary sampling to determine the extent of, of habitat use by non-native bullfrogs. Uh, and we also were detecting some native species as well. So that, that was some work that was done in the MCA specific to bullfrogs and, and native amphibians. So next we'll talk about uh, some of the fisheries management within the NCAs. Um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife manages the fish, obviously as our state fish and game agency. Uh, but BLM does work cooperatively to monitor important populations of fish. Uh, and BLM, of course, manages large expanses of important aquatic habitat with both of, within both of these NCA units. Um, the BLM does assist with fish sampling, as many of the sampling methods require numerous personnel to conduct effectively. Uh, and then BLM will also sample some of the high priority small streams that CPW or Colorado Parks and Wildlife may not always have the time to help sample. Um, so some of the active uh, sampling and monitoring techniques that we use, um, th there, there's a variety of methods that are used to sample and monitor fish populations. Th these are three primary ones that we use within the NCAs and those include uh, that lowest picture is, is an electrofishing raft. That's probably the primary tool to, to sample for fish along the bigger river systems or even some of the smaller streams, there's backpack versions of electrofishers. Uh, these put out a low low pulse of electricity into the water. It does stun the fish so that they can be netted, placed in holding tanks or a bucket, and then identified um, what species they are, measured, weighed, uh, checked for any tags they may have, or tagged if they're not tagged, and then returned back to the water. Um, the upper left photo is a picture of a, a, a hoop net. Uh, these can be set and then fish funnel into the hoop nets and become trapped in the back of the net. And then again, we can collect those fish, collect information on what species are using the stream, uh, and then collect length and weight data. And then the top right photo is another example. Uh, it's a seine. You, you, can, you, you can pull a seine net through the water to, to scoop up fish and, and then put them into a holding um, net and then collect information on species, lengths, and weights. So all of these are active sampling methods that are used to help us biologists monitor important fish populations, and, and we utilize these within the NCA on occasions. Uh, what's becoming more, more prominent in the fisheries world is the use of more passive sampling methodologies. Um, shown here are pit tags. Um, these are really cool. So these are similar to what, what are put in pets to kind of monitor your pets. You're probably familiar with them. So they're pretty small. I didn't have a scale picture here, but these are less than the size of a dime as far as their, their length across. Um, and, and many of the habitats used by these native fish species, particularly during the spring flows when the Colorado and the Gunnison River are really turbid and muddy, they're really difficult to sample with, with the electrofishing. You might be stunning fish, but it's really hard to even see them to get a net on them. So, so Utilizing pit tags to, to monitor our fish is, is kind of a neat tool that's being used. Um, these pit tags stands for passive integrative transponder tags. So again, these are implanted into individual fish, either in the fish hatchery before they get stocked out, or during sampling events when we encounter wild fish during sampling, um, Parks and Wildlife and other agencies across the entire Colorado River Basin, other states, other agencies, are all cooperatively standardizing the use of the types of pit tags that are used to, to, to implant into fish so that these fish can be monitored across the entire Colorado River Basin, both the endangered fish as well as some of the, primarily the three species fish, the flannel mouth, sucker, bluehead sucker, and round tailed chub. Uh, so along with these pit tags that go into the fish are the antennas that, that detect their use. So um, once these fish are tagged, you know, there, there's, there's these antennas and there's, these, these are a couple of examples of the more portable antennas that can get placed in the bottom of a creek or a smaller stream. These are really portable, which is nice. You can kind of move them around and, and, and site, site these into specific habitat types that you're trying to detect use by, by fish that would be tagged. Um, the, the fish needs to swim within about 18 inches of these to, to be detected. Um, and, and then when a, swish, a fish that's tagged does swim within the range of this antenna, it, 
the pit tag recorder kind of pings that, that data point. So it, it logs that pit tag number along with the time and the date. And then once that information is downloaded, biologists can go look up that tag number in a, a large database that all the biologists in the Colorado River Basin have access to and determine when that fish was first pit tagged uh, and any information on its length and weight at the time of tagging, as well as other collections that may have occurred by other fish biologists within the basin. Uh, here's a little bit larger antenna. This is one that would, would span an entire creek. Um, uh, and then there's even larger antennas that are being deployed on the Colorado River, the Green River, some of the larger rivers. There's, there's large antennas that are across the entire river to, to also detect fish use, uh, primarily endangered fish, but obviously they're also collecting data on other tagged fish. Um, and you can also see some of the onshore equipment, that the solar power that kind of runs these larger pit tags arrays, uh, and then also helps power the, the data collection. Uh, and like, like I said, there's several of these larger type antennas within the Colorado River Basin that help monitor movement of native fish across the larger basin. So next, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the cooperative projects uh, that we've got going with Colorado Parks and Wildlife within the NCAs. I'm going to talk about Salt Creek um, pretty extensively and some of the, the work we've done on bony tail stocking and native fish monitoring. A little bit of uh, fish use in a couple of uh, streams that are mostly dry during the year, East Creek and Cottonwood Creek. And then I'll, I'll talk about a project my counterpart, Rush to Puntage, did uh, for cutthroat trout in the North, North Fork of Escalante. So starting with uh, Salt Creek, in 2014, Colorado Parks and Wildlife was sampling the Colorado River and discovered a bony tail in the mouth of Salt Creek within the NCA. Um, Salt Creek had been sampled regularly, but had never been known to harbor any endangered fish species. None had ever been found there. Based on the finding of that bony tail, Colorado Parks and Wildlife initiated a project to stop pit tagged bony tails directly into Salt Creek and utilize the portable pit tag readers that, that I showed you, those antennas to kind of track movements and habitat use of these stocked fish in Salt Creek. Uh, collected data was, was going to be used to inform use of Salt Creek by that species, help describe movements of those fish within and out of the system into the Colorado River and back, and, and perhaps detect spawning areas for, the, for those species. Uh, so the information I'm going to be sharing on Salt Creek uh, antenna data uh, is from 2015 to 2017. Uh, Parks and Wildlife has not yet fully analyzed all of the data from 2018 to present. So this is a little bit outdated, but still some cool information to share uh, on the use of Salt Creek within the McGinnis Canyon NCA. So again, Parks and Wildlife initiated the stocking protocol. Uh, they were stocking approximately 500 adult bony tail into Salt Creek each year, except for 2020 because of COVID. Uh, and again, all of these fish were pit tagged prior to uh, being stocked at the, at the fish hatchery. And, and BLM, obviously, we partnered with Parks and Wildlife on this project because this was all occurring within Salt Creek, within the, the NCA on BLM managed lands. Um, and three of those portable pit tag readers were placed in the stream. Uh, near the confluence of the Colorado River and then upstream for approximately two and a half miles. So the pit tag readers um, between 2015 and 2017 collected a total of 1,650 pit tag detections representing 447 unique individual fish. Uh, based on the tag data, 255 of those fish were bony tails that had been stocked into Salt Creek and were detected within a short time period after release. So not very surprising, obviously. We stocked pit tagged fish, they went by the, the pit tag readers and, and they pinged them and we collected that data, not surprising. However, 99 of those uh, 447 fish were bony tails that were not stocked into Salt Creek but were instead stocked into the Colorado River. So those fish had actually moved out of the Colorado River and into Salt Creek. So that was kind of cool. And then the remaining 88 fish of those 447 fish were comprised of five additional native fish species that were pit tagged uh, that I'll talk about a little bit more here. 
Uh, so again, the bony tail, 255 bony tails were detected all within the first couple months of being released. Uh, we did have four bony tails that were detected the following year post stocking. Uh, and we had one individual that was detected two years. So in 2015, it was stopped and we detected it on one of the antennas in 2017. So that was encouraging to know that these stocked fish were actually, at least some of them were surviving. Uh, in addition to the, the, the stocked bony tail, which was kind of the impetus for the whole study to begin with, uh, was we found that uh, these, these pit tag antenna readers were collecting information on other species. We had endangered Colorado pike minnow also using Salt Creek based on the tag data. Uh, we, between 2015 and 2017, we had six individuals that were detected using Salt Creek. Uh, and four of the five individuals that visited the Salt Creek antenna in 2016 returned about the same time period in the spring in 2017. So they were, they were using Salt Creek each year. Uh, what was kind of neat was the Colorado pike minnow with tag number B44 was a fish that had not been encountered since 2005. Uh, and Colorado pike minnow number 477 had not been encountered since 2008. So we were, we were collecting data on fish that hadn't been seen by biologists in, in several years. Uh, so this is kind of a, a story of, of another pike minnow. This is pike minnow number F37. Uh, I'll kind of walk you through a, a little depiction of habitat use of this species, including Salt Creek. So this is a map of the Colorado River, the Green River, and Salt Creek. Uh, you can see the Colorado River there, Grand Junction coming down to the confluence with the Green River, uh, the Green River going up north past Green River, Utah. And then Salt Creek's there kind of on the upper right where it comes into the, the Colorado River in the McGinnis Canyon NCA. So um, the, the following, when I click on this, it'll kind of show you the travels of, of pike minnow number F37 at several pit tag antennas that are located within the, the Colorado River Basin and on the Green River. So this fish was first collected or, or, or collected during a fish sampling expedition, probably by Utah Division of Wildlife in 2006 in June um, as an 11 inch fish just upstream of the confluence with the Green River. Uh, it was collected approximately a year later in about the same location. And then it sort of disappeared off the radar for about nine years. No, no biologist had detected it. Uh, it resurfaced nine years later, way upstream near Palisade on the main stem Colorado River at the Price Stub antenna. This, that's one of those large detection antennas that goes across the entire Colorado River near Palisade. Uh, so that, that there was a movement of at least 217 miles. 77 days later, in July of 2016, that fish was found clear up past Green River, Utah on the Green River in the Green River Canal. Uh, so in that 77 day period in 2016, that fish moved 316 miles. Uh, the fish was then detected again in April of 2016, still in the canal. But then 29 days later, it swam all the way back down and then up the confluence and clear back up and we we detected it on our Salt Creek antenna in September of 2016. So it was in Salt Creek now. In 2017, it showed back up near Palisade on the Colorado River. It was still there in August of 2017. And then it came back to Salt Creek almost a year to the day from 2016 when it last used Salt Creek. So just, just neat to show the movements of, of fish number F37. Um, this fish you know, traveled a minimum of 903 miles and is utilizing habitats in the Green River, the Colorado River and Salt Creek within the McGinnis Canyon NCA. So it's really cool to show the habitat connectivity and the importance of, of the entire Colorado River Basin to these native fish and, and the amount of movements that these, these native fish do. It's really cool. So. Okay, beyond pike minnow using, uh, using Salt Creek, we also detected uh, endangered razorback suckers in Salt Creek from 2015 to 2017. 
We had a total of 25 individuals detected. 17 of these fish had never been encountered anywhere else. And 11 of those fish had been at large for two to seven years. So biologists hadn't seen these in a while. Uh, and again, it's, it's apparent that we as biologists are probably missing some of these fish that may be spending more time in tributaries than was previously thought because we haven't been traditionally sampling the tributaries specifically for these species. Uh, in addition to the endangered fish, uh, the three species fishes, the, the flannel mouth sucker, blue head sucker, and round tailed chub were also documented using Salt Creek based on the databases, uh, the database uh, analysis based on the pit tag antenna. Um, and again, not surprising that these fish were using Salt Creek. Um, from 2015 to 2017, the antennas detected the use of Salt Creek by a couple of blue head suckers, five flannel mouth suckers, and 42 round tailed chubs. Uh, that seems like a small number of fish, but it's important to note that up to 2017, only a few thousand fish of each of these three species had been tagged with pit tags from projects within the Colorado River. So it's very likely that Salt Creek is seeing an abundance of, of use by these three species, um, but only a small portion are actually pit tagged to be detected. So some of the conclusions uh, on our work in, with Parks and Wildlife in Salt Creek are that you know, these, these endangered fish are certainly using tributaries, including Salt Creek, much more than we might have thought. Uh, and this is, this is important evidence for us to support the importance of smaller tributaries to these, these big river endangered fish. Uh, I think tributaries were largely overlooked uh, regarding their importance for endangered fish. It was just kind of assumed that they were only big river dwellers, but we're obviously, they're obviously using these tributaries seasonally. Um, and in fact, they seem to have an affinity for Salt Creek, given that they're coming back in multiple years near the same time of year. Um, these antennas are really giving us some cool information on, on habitat use of, of these small micro habitats, you know, things such as spawning areas, you know, what time of year they're moving into these tributaries, presumably for spawning. Uh, and then these antennas are helping to inform, you know, population and habitat connectivity, like I showed you on, on Pike Minnow F37. You know, all those antenna detections kind of showed you some of the movement that one individual fish did and how important it is for that individual and for the populations to be able to use large expanses of habitat within the larger basin. Um, these antennas have also allowed us to, you know, increase our detections of individual fish that would not otherwise occur based on how difficult it can be to sample during the spring when the water is really turbid and muddy. It's helping us locate missing fish that have been, you know, kind of lost from, from uh, um, or haven't been encountered for several years. Uh, and then it's helping us describe these broader basin-wide fish movements, movements like I showed you with the pike minnow. Uh, and it, it's really just documenting the importance of that larger scale habitat connectivity for these, these native fish. So next I'll talk a little bit about East Creek and Cottonwood Creek. Again, these are two streams located within uh, the Dominguez Escalani NCA. These streams are generally intermittent to ephemeral. So they, they really can flow big in the spring during a good snowpack year during snow melt season. But then they generally go dry uh, during late summer through fall and winter. Uh, if, you, if you've lived here for a while, you probably recall that 2011 was an exceptionally good snowpack you know, winter snowpack year, and we had a really good spring runoff year. Uh, and we sampled both of these, 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 both of these tributaries were sampled, and, and we did detect fish use of these streams by native fishes, uh, primarily the three species fishes, the flannel mouth sucker, bluehead sucker, and, and uh, round-tailed chub. So this, this is a photo kind of showing you, yeah, East Creek when it's flowing, and then how it looks sometimes uh, during the dry time of year. Uh, and again, this is Cottonwood Creek, real similar situation. This is the same photo. This is a good Good photo my counterpart Rush Japuntich took. That photo on the right shows good spring flowing conditions and then what the creek looks like kind of midsummer when the flows recede and snow melts finished, it, the stream essentially dries up. Uh, this, stream, this stream in particular is, is really significant given the, the large volume of native fish using this, this uh, you know, nearly ephemeral to intermittent stream each, each spring during the spawning time. Uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife initiated research uh, on native bluehead sucker, flannel mouth sucker, as well as non-native white sucker use of, of this creek, Cottonwood Creek, 
and they utilize the wear trap to kind of collect fish on their spring move, movements and journey from the Gunnison River up into Cottonwood Creek. So here's a little video clip kind of showing the amount of fish use in Cottonwood Creek. So I don't know if you could hear that audio part, but that that was that was my counterpart rush to punch. It's taking some video there showing that on May 25th in Cottonwood Creek, you, you, there was this large pulse of native fish moving upstream. You know, as far as you could see upstream, there was just this large abundance of native fish. So really cool. You know, the, the stream is largely dry for large chunks of the year. And yet in the spring when there's flow, you know, these, these large pulses of, of native fish move up into these tributaries to spawn. It's really cool. Uh, so again, based on, on our sampling and, and some of the monitoring and some of the research parks and wildlife done, it, it, it's shown that both Cottonwood Creek and East Creek are, are important, at least seasonally, to these three species. Uh, they appear to be important spawning tributaries of the Gunnison River within the, the Dominguez Escalante and CA. Um, for the BLM, you know, it's important for us to know that the fish are using these often dry streams on a seasonal basis so that we can appropriately manage these smaller streams and, and try to protect those habitats uh, that are often overlooked. Um, yeah, if we hadn't sampled in the spring, we, we might have thought, ah, there's no way fish could use those. You know, it only runs for, for maybe a month or so in the spring, but uh, it's, it's pretty neat to see, you know, two foot, two foot long fish utilizing these otherwise dry streams during a, a spring, spring period when there's good snow melt. So next up, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about a project that my counterpart Rush to Puntich did in the Dominguez Escalani NCA. Um, this is North Fork Escalani Creek. Again, it was a uh, it was exciting news when genetics results from fin clipped cutthroat trout came back as pure. Uh, this told us that we had a, a new conservation population of Colorado River cutthroat trout in North Fork Escalante Creek uh, within the NCA there. Um, the problem was is we also had some non-native rainbow trout, as I said, uh, in the lower end of the stream. They were, there were there were some native rainbow trout in the lower end of Escalante Creek, I'm sorry, of, of the North Fork of Escalante Creek, uh, near the confluence with Escalante Creek. Uh, so my counterpart, Russ, uh, to, to protect the headwaters from invasion by those non-native rainbow trout. Uh, Russ initiated a cooperative effort with Trout Unlimited, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and the US Forest Service, as well as a private landowner to construct a protective fish barrier. So this feature here was constructed to uh, protect several miles of occupied cutthroat, tra how, uh, <laughs> occupied cutthroat trout habitat upstream of this point uh, from invasion by non-native rainbow trout. Uh, again, rainbow trout are a problem because they can readily breed and hybridize with native cutthroat trout. And they can also compete for food and habitat. Uh, as a win-win, uh, Russ was able to, to get a new water diversion structure constructed uh, for the private landowner, uh, the private water rights holder. So uh, again, it was a crucial to garner support for the protective fish barrier. You know, so it, it's, it shows that you know, we can work with our private land partners to. Uh, to do good things for water rights holders, for instance, as well as for native fish within these NCA units. Uh, so getting close to wrapping up here, I guess, um, some of the future fisheries and amphibian work that we have planned um, within the NCAs, uh, we're gonna continue to, to do the bony tail stocking with parks and wildlife and, and, and monitor fish use within Salt Creek. We still have antennas out right now collecting data. And of course we have lots of, of antenna data at, to analyze. Again, I was only able to show you the 2015 to 2017 data, but we've got several more years of data that needs to be analyzed. And I'm sure we've got some really cool information on some additional endangered and other native fish use. Uh, we're gonna continue to inventory populations um, of fish and amphibians uh, across the NCA where those populations occur. Uh, I'm planning to go into a Mee Canyon and Knowles Canyon this summer to try to collect and ID those fish species that were seen during the amphibian work. That'll be kind of fun. Uh, my counterpart, Russ, 
and, and probably me a little bit in Big Dominguez Creek have opportunities to, to potentially do some non-native rainbow trout removals with Parks and Wildlife. It would really be their project, but to partner with Parks and Wildlife to maybe replace some of these non-native rainbow trout fisheries with native cutthroat trout fisheries. So we're, we're looking at those opportunities. Um, obviously other projects um, we, we're interested in are, are related to, to habitat connectivity. As, as we showed, you know, the, the importance of habitat connectivity to these large native fish in the, in the main stem rivers is really important. Um, so we're looking at possibilities to include, you know, to improve water diversions, try to fix those to make sure they're passable by fish and do other habitat improvements uh, where needed to, to try to improve conditions for these species. Um, obviously, we'd like to get the endangered fish off the endangered species list and we want to keep those fish that aren't currently on the endangered species list off. So. Um, and, then, and then we do want to continue to work with our partners primarily Colorado Parks and Wildlife and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on reducing non-native competitive species uh, to try to manage these particular areas uh, for native fish versus non-native fish species. Uh, so anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this talk. I hope, I hope you guys learned something about some of the really cool native aquatic species of the, of the NCAs and perhaps have a, a little bit better understanding and appreciation for some of these uh, species. Um, I, I will end with a quote from naturalist Aldo Leopold that I'm particularly fond of. I think it, it's really cool. It kind of relates to these native fish species. So, so again, this is Aldo Leopold. Um, if the land mechanism as a whole is good, then every part is good, whether we understand it or not. To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. I think that's just a really cool, you know, really cool saying, and it really sums up perfectly why we should protect and care about these underappreciated species. You know, every part is good and we must keep and protect them, even if we don't quite understand them. And, and we're certainly learning more about these native fish all the time and really some of the cool aspects of their biology. So um, with that, I would happy to be I'm happy to try to answer any questions I might have. Um, I have another video if there's time I could try to show. It's, it's, it's another cool video that the Utah Division of Wildlife put together on, a, on the movements of a razorback sucker that visited both the, the McGinnis Canyon and, and Dominguez Escalani NCAs. But I, I can play that maybe at the end if you want, or I can try to answer questions first here. So thanks for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Tom. Lots of good information on that. And I know I learned a lot. Um, we do have a couple questions here. And if uh, we, we only have a few minutes left, but if anyone else has any other questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box or the q and I'll get to the few questions we have. Um, Len is asking, what emphasis is being placed on habitat connectivity and the tracking of fish movement? Is there a specific project for it? Right. Um, well, the, the, the main impetus, and, and I apologize, I just realized how long I went, so I, I really went long. I apologize. <laughs> That's fine. Lots of good, good stuff to cover. Yeah, I'm a fish nerd. I could talk forever about these cool fish. So <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, the, the main impetus for a lot of this, this work on fish movements and the, and the pit tagging is the endangered fish. Obviously, biologists who are trying to recover the, the four endangered fish are trying to get more information on habitat movement, habitat connectivity. Um, so so that, that's kind of the project in a sense that, that kind of initiated this was really just trying to do, uh, get more information on, on use by endangered fish within the Colorado River Basin such that we can try to improve conditions for them and, and try to get them off the endangered species list. So if, if that kind of answers your question. Great. And then we have someone asking, what's your favorite amphibian? Oh, my, boy, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, those leopard frogs are really cool. Just the, the color variations within the northern leopard frogs and that spotting pattern, it, it's really cool. Um, it, you know, I, I get to work with those a fair amount. We've done some projects in different offices beyond the NCAs for that species to, to fence off some areas from livestock and yeah, I, I guess leopard frogs would probably be one of my favorites, but there, there's so many cool amphibian species out there. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, we are at 630. 
Um, if folks do have any other questions, um, Tom, would you would you be fine with people reaching out to you directly to get any other questions answered or shoot you a message? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Like I say, I, I, I could talk about this stuff for a long time. <laughs> These species are really neat and they're, they're fun to talk about. So I, I'm happy to try to answer any questions that I can anytime you bet. All right, well, great. Um, yes, thank you so much for joining us and for all of that great information. Um, if you enjoyed this webinar, we do have another webinar coming up June 1st, so in about a month, it's gonna be about the dark skies in Gunnison Gorge NCA. Um, we're working to get Gunnison Gorge designated as a night sky park. So we'll be talking about some uh, dark sky conservation efforts going on and some some events we have coming up. So I'm putting that link in the chat box. If you're interested, go ahead and sign up. Um, you can also, through that link, just find out more about Colorado Canyons Association and some of the other events that we have planned. Once again, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I hope that we see you, um, you know, either virtually or maybe in person in the upcoming months. Um, so thank you so much and reach out to either one of us if you have any questions. Have a great night and bye. Yeah, thank you again, everyone. I appreciate it.